Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Hello. Thank you. Hi, Debbie. I can't tell you how much I love the unthinkable. Wow, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. I think Chelsea will even tell you as soon as they sent me anything about the film, I'm like, oh my God, a, a Scandinavian disaster film. Gimme, 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 gimme. Um, I don't know what it is, but be it Sweden, Norway, Denmark, all, you know, the filmmakers, you guys all know really how to make a good disaster film. Thank you. Really fun to make. And this one goes off in a direction I never would have suspected. Um, it hits very close to home in the 21st century that this is well within the realm of possibility with all the times we see social media going down, the Internet going down. Um, we could very easily see energy lines being disrupted and, communi and additional communications but what you also do that I, that, so the unthinkable really gives us a double entendre here of the unthinkable is really the amount of hatred, lack of forgiveness, lack of compassion that we see come out in the people of this town. And that's what I find so striking set against the unfolding physical disasters behind it. Really, really interesting, and I love it. Oh, thank you. That's great. You know, wh you. where did the idea arise for this film? Because it is not your traditional disaster film. No, it isn't. Um, Sweden, Sweden is a small country. We haven't been in war for, like, uh, several Hundreds of hundreds of years, and uh, we have been saved from uh, up till until recent years from terrorist attacks and big uh, nature disasters. And we wanted the Swedes and the people who watched the movies ask themselves the, the question: What would I do if this happened to us? What would I do if the air raid alarm went off in the morning? Uh, who would I call? Who would I think of? And we wanted to take a spin of the usual disaster movie and um, and tell it from the people's perspective, from you and I, uh, and not through the police or the military or the, the people who are used to um, tell these stories through. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the great things here is that while the bulk of this film is through Alex's uh, point of view, you really, we get to really embrace and understand the people through all of the supporting characters. Uh, and I find that very interesting, the way you structured that, and it's so effective and really connects us to this story. Exactly. That, 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 that was uh, exactly the idea. And um, we, um, we let the movie take time. Uh, we start with, um, with uh, Alex and Anna and his father, uh, Bjorn, and uh, let the audience connect with these characters. Let them see the life they have been lived through and, um, and when the disaster finally hits. Um, we hopefully connect more with them and um, care with them and um, yeah oh I, I think definitely and I, I you did make me laugh because as the line of cars and everybody is trying to get into the bunker uh, and you've got Hobie's wife who will not get out of the car it's like I'm yeah. not going in there it's dirty I'm not going in there um, it just makes you laugh because you really capture all these different sensibilities of people uh, with through this film. And little things like that add so much and really humanize it. Um, you know, this film is all about your, your visuals really bring this home. And I've got to say, Victor, what you and, and your cinematographer and editor Hannes do are just, it's amazing with the forest, with the rain, um, with the bunker, absolutely stunning. And I know you shot on the, on the Sony FS7, which is great for low light, 
So I'm curious your approach to the shooting, to the lighting and lensing here. Uh, well, thank you. First, uh, we uh, we choose the S7 because, as you said, the low light performance is great at that time, uh, and uh, we also shot the movie on um, old Russian uh, lenses that we uh, bought for just like uh, some few bucks and modify them uh, to look like anamorphic lenses. Mm -hmm. And we did, yeah, we did all that kind of tricks to make the movie look grounded and gritty and uh, not that typical, um, as you call it, Hollywood style. Right. And uh, yeah, to make it uh, feel more real. And also with the lighting, we used uh, a lot of na na natural light. And um, also in the work with, uh, with the actors, we let them, we didn't rehearse a lot. We just let them um, play out the scenes and uh, feel free from the script and improvise and just let the camera go uh, with them. All yeah. to, to make it more feel more real. Well, and you definitely succeed. And something you also do that's very interesting is you can't, you stay away from extreme close-ups, except in a few instances with Alex. You keep us on the bigger picture. You go with a mid, you know, a mid shot to a wider shot, so we really get a scope um, of of being more quote unquote global within the city. And I really like that because you so easily could have gone for all these really extreme close-ups, but you shied away from that. And I think that makes it more relatable and connectable as well. Well, thank you. Yeah, that, that's great to hear. That was both our, our goal. You know, I, I would be remiss not to bring up one of the best car action sequences in the history of film, that that bridge action sequence with what do you have thirteen cars crashing spiraling yeah, cartwheeling, absolutely phenomenal. Did you execute that practically or bring in CGI? How did you pull that off? We have a, a philosophy uh, in the, uh, inside the group to try to shoot as much much as possible in camera, uh, and for this scene, it's. Um, it takes place outside uh, the Swedish, um, what do you call it in English, Albin? Uh, what, Parliament, Embassy? The Parliament, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like the Parliament, yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. So we, um, we couldn't shoot there, of course. And we had to uh, block the, the, the road for several days, so it was not, not, not an option. Uh, so we rented uh, old air... Force, um, what do you call it? Air, um, airport, mm -hmm. and um, put the markings on uh, the um, the road, mm -hmm. mainly like uh, road signs and, and, and stuff like that. So we had all the cars for real. We had the, the rain uh, mostly for real, and then we replaced all of the background uh, in post with a, a digital copy of the Swedish parliament. Uh, so everything you see, uh, the cars, the actors, the, the action uh, that you look at, and uh, that's uh, for real, and the background is not. Wow. That is, it truly is one of the best car action sequences in film. Um, it, it's phenomenal. You know, I've got to ask you about the, your score, Gustav Spetz's score. The music yeah. is so key here. Uh, you've got, it's a haunting sense, a foreboding sense. What were you looking at musically for this film? Um, partly the same as with the, the image and the camera work. We wanted it to feel like organic and, um, and uh, gritty. We wanted it to feel not like this typical Hollywood uh, soundtrack. We wanted it to have like this, uh, analog um, vibe, uh, something that's more uh, ambient, you can call it maybe, mm -hmm. or not like this, um, um, yeah, not, not, not really the, this uh, Hollywood style, it's something more organic and personal and, and unique for this movie. Yeah, and it fits very well with the whole idea of the rain 
being this contaminant that is wiping away memories because the rain is organic. So it, yeah. it fits really nicely. I know Chelsea's going to take me away in a minute, but I've got to ask, I want to ask Albin, you know, as a producer, what is it that makes this the perfect kind of film for crazy pictures to be making? Uh, I think, <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, it's the mix somewhere between like uh, the personal and the, uh, and uh, the more spectacular. I think that's something that, that we really like to do spectacular things, but always keep, keep it personal and keep it uh, to the characters. Uh, and to to um, yeah take the take the audience uh, on an adventure, uh, and that's what we are planning for our upcoming films too to to make something for the cinema audience. Now I know this was this was Victor. This was your first feature directorial, was it not, or second? Yeah, it was. It was the first uh, film we produced uh, for the whole Chris Pictures. Okay, now for both of you then, how, you know, was there a learning curve going from short films into the narrative feature, especially one with it is such a big cast, you've got these big action set pieces happening, and just the very nature of the story. Was there a big learning curve for you guys making this leap? Absolutely, definitely, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, we our short films, we have like... Uh, Two, maybe three days of shooting for this film. We have had 115 <gasps> days of shooting. We had a, a small team, and uh, that, that was the idea to have a small team, to not um, to have in, instead put the money on having a lot of time uh, to do things right and, and to try things out. What did you learn as filmmakers in making the in making the unthinkable? that you can now implement into your future feature work? Uh, I would say, like, if, we, if you are working together as a team, you can achieve uh, big stuff uh, quite easily and quite smart. That a small team isn't less effective than a big team. Maybe the opposite. And what about for you, Albin? Yeah, I think that uh, we've been learning that um, um, yeah, to put together a project like this is like uh, it's such a journey, and uh, I think it's we kind of have learned from everything, from like uh, from doing production, from uh, scheduling, from uh, casting, from yeah, all things. So I think this uh, has been kind of such a good lesson for us to do our next film, and uh, it's just uh, yeah. Uh, We've been learning a lot everywhere. <laughs> oh, guys, well, I can't thank you enough. And I want more. I want to see more from Crazy Pictures. More disasters. You will. You will. <laughs> thank you, guys. Mm -hmm.